you know, as a culture, we're too obsessed with price. I mean, industrial agriculture does an amazing job of giving us cheap meat, you know. Um, meat is something, you know, uh, beef or chicken, take chicken. I mean, this was luxury food, you know, for most of history. And, and in America up until, you know, World War II or the 50s, um, chicken was the, the expense of meat you had on Sundays. And um, it's astonishing how cheap it is. Um, and so that's what a lot of people see. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from author Michael Pollan. He's transformed the thinking of so many of us through his books about food and food production, including The Omnivore's Dilemma, In Defense of Food, and The Botany of Desire. Michael shared his latest thoughts about the food system with us for this year's Real Organic Symposium, which is still available to watch at realorganic2022.org. We received so many comments already about how much people appreciated hearing from Michael, as he clearly has a deep understanding of the injustices in the food system. So let's return to Dave Chapman's interview with Michael Pollan. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast, and I am very pleased to be talking with Michael Pollan today. Uh, Michael needs no introduction, so hello, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> You're serious about that? <laughs> you don't. People know who you are very well, and uh, okay, I'll say one thing. I just finished rereading The Omnivore's Dilemma, and 15 years later, it is still an astonishing book. Congratulations. It is a real tour de force. You said so many important things and you said them very well. Uh, I, I, was, I was very impressed by it. Um, Thanks. I, I, I have no idea how well it holds up. I have not had occasion to, to reread it. Yeah. Um, although I may have an opportunity because um, I didn't do the audio book for that. That was in the days where they had actors do them. And it really bugs me, it rankles me that it's not my voice. And so I've asked my publisher if we could do a new edition that I would read. And then I'd get to reread it. Yeah, I think that'd be great, actually. You have a good, you have a good voice for your words. And um, I listened to a lot of it. And he did okay. He did. But it would be better. Yeah, if, I know. He's, yeah. he's perfectly fine. But if a book written in the first person, you want to hear from the author. Yeah. So, well, thanks for that. Well, so the book spends a lot of time uh, rather elegantly describing the problems that we face, and, and they're very real. And I'd like to talk a little bit about solutions, but first I would like to go back and talk about the problems. One of the things that amazes me is that, um, in my mind, a book like that should just change everything. And it does for some people, but it doesn't for a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of people who listen to this who would agree with you still haven't read it. And maybe they will now. Um, so the, the problems of modern agriculture and, and big ag in particular, could you just talk about that for a minute? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think often and I'm asked often about how things have changed since then. And they've changed at the level of the conversation, at the level of the culture, at the level of people's knowledge of the food system. Um, but we still have a food system dominated by a small number of very powerful corporations. And no amount of um, shift in the consumer's point of view is going to change that, I don't think. I mean, this is really... Um, a matter for the government, for policy, for antitrust enforcement, things like that. And so I've come to think that until we get action at that level, um, we're not going to see profound change. Um, concentration is, if anything, worse than it was in 2006 when that book was published. Um, but there's a lot more awareness of it. It's a conversation. There are people in the Biden administration who, who know that story and, um, and are eager to change it. Um, I'm thinking of Lena Khan, who's now the head of the Federal Trade Commission. That's astonishing. When I first started reading her 
I mean, you go back and read her Washington Monthly piece on the chicken industry, she nailed it all down. I mean, it, you know, that chapter could have been in Omnivore's Dilemma. And now she has power to do something about it. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, the industry will fight back and may well prevail, <laughs> but, um, but we have a shot. Um, so, you know, less has changed than I would have hoped in this, in this period of time. I do see, though, that the consumer is a lot more um, knowledgeable and sophisticated. Um, obviously, the, the market for alternative, uh, if, we, if we lump together alternative food and we include organic and local and um, grass-fed or pastured, even if it's not organic, um, that's a lot bigger than it was by tens of billions of dollars. Um, but we know how big the food industry is and it's not... It's not a, as a percentage matter, it's not a huge, a huge amount. Um, but, you know, I think the conversation has shifted um, and that there, is, uh, there are tons of young people engaged by the food movement who want to get in. I just had office hours with a uh, Harvard senior who's like dying to dive in as soon as she graduates. She's passionate about agriculture. Um, she had one of those transformative experiences working on a farm. You know, Harvard kids didn't go work on farms before 2006, <laughs> you know. And so that's what I mean when I say there's change at the level of the conversation as to what, um, uh, uh, you know, and the value of farm work or the prestige of farm work, I think, has changed. Um, not that the work's gotten any easier, but I think the culture, yeah. the, the culture really had, a, had a, a pretty condescending view of farmers. Um, you know, before the food movement really takes off in the two th early 2000s. Yeah. And I think that's changed. So I, I can point to lots of change, but fundamentally we're, we're in the same system. Um, a handful of companies are feeding us um, and uh, they're, uh, you know, doing it in a way that's brutal to, to workers, brutal to, to animals. Um, and, uh, and they're hiding from us, you know, how our food is produced as best they can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I live in this world where uh, I'm a small farmer, but I do sell into supermarket chains. And I, it's very confusing to me because I see these two almost alternate uh, economies. And one is this local CSA farmer's market. And I happen to be one of the few still selling into the maw of the big, big chains. But I see the big chains are being owned by fewer and fewer companies now. Yeah. I mean, it really is amazing. Well, when I wrote Omnivore's Dilemma, Whole Foods was the big bad actor in organic. And I, you know, it was a very critical chapter about how they had uh, um, diluted the vision of, of, of organic and, and, um, and how they were playing with the image of small agriculture when they weren't actually buying from small agriculture. And now they're part of Amazon. Um, yeah. And, uh, and they're small in the organic market compared to Walmart. Yeah, well, Walmart's the biggest producer it now. It is, yeah. And, you know, you can argue that's a good or bad development. I mean, that's a lot more organic food being sold. It's a lot more people uh, who aren't elite being uh, exposed and, and, you know, receiving organic food. Um, there's a benefit to that. I yes. mean, it's very hard on the farmers. Um, but, you know, it's funny, I often ask, I'll often ask audiences, how would you feel if McDonald's went all organic? And like invariably people boo. And because it's an offensive idea at some basic level. It's the, the spirit of organic just doesn't have room for <laughs> McDonald's. Um, but, you know, how many tens of thousands of acres of cornfields won't be, you know, sprayed with herbicide? Um, yeah. How many, you know, the reduction of residues of pesticides in the diet of, millions of people. I mean, there, there are real benefits. Um, right. And, uh, to, you know, democratizing things often means diluting them. It's just a kind of fact of life. Um, but on the other hand, you need, you, you still need people holding, holding up the ideal and the standard and, and, um, defending that as, as powerfully as they can. Um, cause otherwise just everything, you know, becomes the least common denominator. Yeah. You know, one of the things that 
uh, is said to me is that the Real Organic Project is divisive. And uh, said to me a couple weeks ago by Danone, and said to me by another big corporate player, and, and but by friends too. And so my question is, is it divisive to, to say the truth? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it is. It depends. It depends what 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 world are you speaking into? Where are you right. intervening? Um, politics is often divisive. Um, you know, there. It's it's a weird criticism. Um, you know, I think the dilemma that's faced by the critics of organic within organic is that there's a very precious brand here that all benefit from. Some people may be hiding behind it practices that don't deserve to be called organic. Other people are doing it the way it should be done in the spirit of organic. Um, But the fight itself can do damage to the brand um, if it's not done right. I mean, you know, and I think, and that's why it's, it's it's not inevitable that it be divisive, but I think you have to pick your battles carefully, and they have to. You have to stand on ground that makes sense to people, like soil. Soil is like so central to, you know, if you're defending the role of soil in organic, you are defending the heart and soul of organic. Mm-hmm. But you can imagine other critiques that are, you know, simply against bigness or. Um, uh, um, you know, there's other groups that have come along over the years that have thrown thrown stones at organic players, um, and uh, and that can be and that can be divisive. So I think it's about choosing your battles. Yeah, yeah, and they have to be battles that can be you know with a story behind them that the that isn't just about big versus little, but it is about fundamental principles. And that's why I think soil is in a very important ground to stand on. Yeah, soil and and of course the other one that. We really embrace is pasture for animals. Yeah, out, outdoors. Yeah, no animals. You know, eating their proper diet and living. You know where <laughs> they evolved to live, which is to say, cows on grass. Yeah. Um, I think that's also a really important ground to stand on. Yeah. the The head of the at the time, the head of the National Organic Program, once said to me that if the animal welfare reform that he was trying to get put through passed and was enacted, it would lead to the decertification of three quarters of the organic eggs in America. That's a big deal. Yeah, that is a big deal. And he, I, he said it because I said, if we don't stop hydroponic now, it'll be too big to fail. And he said, don't tell me about too big to fail. We're, We're not afraid. There. We're going there. Yeah. And of course, six years later, he's gone the reform is gone, the CAFOs are still here. So they were too big to fail. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a very political thing that they that they they killed that. It was actually passed by... But, the, but they're going to kill the golden, you know, this is the goose that laid the golden egg, right? Yeah. And, um, uh, and I think they have to be careful. At a certain point, the, the consumer will turn on this brand and say, this isn't worth it. This is all bullshit. Um, so I, I think it's a dangerous game. I mean, it brings down everybody. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the reasons you see so much interest in regenerative agriculture and, and that label um, or beyond organic. I mean, there, you know, there is an effort to, to establish a new beachhead um, with a better standard. So what do you think of regenerative? I, I, I've been, uh, you know, I know some of the kind of founders were Midwest regenerative farmers and they have all my respect. Um, but that label has been adopted much quicker than organic by Cargill, by yeah. McDonald's, by, you know, everybody, really. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Monsanto loves well, it. Well, the dilution is easy if there's yeah. no certification. That's right. There's no definition. There's no legal right. definition. Yeah. What I think is important about regenerative agriculture is, and it, need, and it still has to be defined, is that it has the potential to update organic. Whether it will or not, I don't know. I mean, organic is a, a system of farming, a way of farming that is, a, that is an historical product of 
a particular environmental concern, which was largely pesticides. It grows out of, I mean, yes, it has a deeper history in England, soil association, all this kind of stuff, but, um, and Rodale and health, but it really takes off because of concern about pesticides. In the marketplace. In the marketplace, LR. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an offspring of Rachel Carson in many ways. Yeah. And the biggest environmental problem of that period was pesticides um, that we knew of. Yeah. And organic addressed that um, by banning uh, synthetic pesticides and, um, and selling pesticide-free food, um, which people embraced because they, they thought it was better for them, healthier. Um, they didn't buy it because of the environmental benefits. That's not what was motivating the consumer, or most consumers. And that's all well and good. But now the biggest environmental problem that we face is climate change. And organic wasn't designed to deal with climate change. Um, it, it, in some respects, does by the nature of its emphasis on soil. But aspects of it don't at all. Um, frequent tillage to deal with weeds, for example, um, is absolutely what you don't want to do if you're concerned about carbon, sequestering carbon, because every time you till, you, you release carbon. So if you were creating organic now, let's say all our memory is gone, we're starting from scratch, we want to build a optimal agriculture to keep the land healthy, keep us healthy, it wouldn't be organic exactly. It would be something slightly different. Um, because it, of tillage. Because it, largely because of tillage. And there may be other things in it too that I'm, you know, I'm not thinking of, but that's the example that uh, comes to mind. Um, but that, that soil carbon sequestration would be very central to the whole thing. Um, now, the fact is sequestering carbon in healthy soils, all these things go together really nicely. So if you can get rid of the tillage and figure out a way to do no-till and organic, um, and uh, pasturing livestock, you know, certainly helps with that. Um, but it would be a slightly different thing and, and should be a slightly different thing in, in, in the world we find ourselves in. Um, so I think if you build regenerative on top of organic, mm -hmm. so in other words, you have to have organic certification and then you can get this super duper certification above that you protect yourself against the Cargills because they don't want to go through the organic part of the process. They just want the word. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, in the world we live in and with the government now controlling the label, um, which is to say, you know, the government plus big money controls the label. I think that might be hard to do. Um, but that's what I, th I find hopeful about regenerative agriculture. I, I think we, we need an agriculture, that is, um, you know, really focused on, on uh, carbon. And um, uh, organic gets us part of the way there, but regenerative could get us further. But it does use herbicides. Well, it, as you say, it's not... I, I almost know of no regenerative on any scale doesn't that use, doesn't use herbicides. They all use glyphosate? Yeah. They use less. Yeah. 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 Less. yeah. But there's also techniques of using rollers, right, to deal with and yeah, pasture just, cropping. Just got, any of this... It just got like four letters from farmers saying this roller crimper doesn't does work. not work. So in, we haven't figured climate, it out yet. my place. I know that's exactly right. I, I also visited some great vegetable farmers in California and uh, no tilt does not work for them yet either. But they're they're really seriously working on it. Yeah. And they're trying to learn. They're not against it. It's just we haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. It's, a, it's an idea whose time might have come, but the models don't really exist. They're very, very small. There's a couple of great four-acre vegetable farms that are doing no-till, but, yeah. but lots and lots of disasters too. So that's just a thing where we haven't figured that out. It's good for livestock. They figured that out. Yeah, it's interesting that that's the easier case. Grass, grass fed, I, yeah. you know, it, it all goes together. But and perennial, it's perennial agriculture. Perennial agriculture. And, and that is, you know, certainly not all organic is, is uh, probably most is not 100% grass fed, but most good organic is yeah. mostly grass fed. Yeah. So I think that there's... 
Yeah, and those farms are sequestering probably tons of carbon. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 concerned about about. I've seen the tremendous excitement about regenerative agriculture, but the reality has not been so exciting for me. It's yeah. You know, it's a great thing to talk about and. Well, I haven't, I mean, I should say I haven't visited regenerative farms. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not doing reporting in this area these days. But I have a student I was just meeting with, actually, who's, who wants to write about regenerative agriculture and is sensitive to the issues of yeah. co-optation. And um, so we'll see. We'll see what she comes up with. And it's just as it is with organic, that there are some real regenerative farmers out there, and they're doing a great job, and they're moving the needle. You know, I, I, I wouldn't farm that way because if they're still using glyphosate, I'm sorry, I've got to find a different way to farm than that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so in all these things. So they're using things. glyphosate to avoid tilling. Yeah. This is, this was, I remember Monsanto took me to see a no-till farm. Um, but glyphosate, you know, I mean, has obvious costs, but it also has unreckoned costs in terms of the soil microbiome. Um, you know, we don't, we don't know what it's doing to the soil. Um, and I can't imagine it's very good. Right, right. No, it's, that's right. Well, we need to find better solutions. And, um, and I, I think ultimately, for me, I don't want it to involve synthetic biocides being put on the ground, but, but we need to fix that. We need to figure it out. We don't know it necessarily. You no, know, weeds remain the great challenge. Right? Yeah, depends on the crop, but yeah, for a lot of things. For pasturing animals, no, it's not a problem really at all. We'll eat those weeds. Yeah, that's right. Um, so in the problem that, that we have an economy dominating, dominated by big food in, in many ways, I didn't realize how exciting farming was when I was young. I actually grew up on a farm, a dairy farm down in Pennsylvania, and farming sounded pretty boring to me. But it's very exciting now. And, and one of the things that's exciting is the deep impact it has on climate change, the deep impact it has on democracy. So what about democracy? Um, you've, you've written about big food and, and you know, big ag and, and big meat and big processing and big stores, big retail. Well, democracy is threatened by constant, large concentrations of wealth. You know, people knew this and understood this uh, at the turn of the last century, and that's why they wrote uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act and all the other antitrust legislations. They were written not to protect consumers from price fixing, although that's all we hear about anymore. They were written to protect the republic against concentrations of power, that it was totally understood that if corporations got so big, they could push the government around and distort everything. And... Um, uh, you know, the word consumer doesn't appear in the Sherman Antitrust Act. It's about power. It's about politics. And those um, antitrust has been rewritten under neoliberalism. I mean, it really happens during the uh, Reagan administration, where um, the Reagan Justice Department decided that they would redefine antitrust and, and set the bar for when you intervened. And they basically said it, it was fine. And this was Robert Bork. It was his theory. He came up with this in a book he wrote a few in the late 70s. And it was basically like combining, corporations combining can lead to great efficiencies. And unless it harms the consumer, uh, we're going to let it happen. Uh, so the test for whether a company has gotten too big or an industry is too concentrated is our prices going up. Mm. Uh, and will a combination lead to higher, uh, you know, higher prices? Um, and if it didn't, fine. And this is a complete perversion of what these laws exist to, to defend against. They were equally concerned with producers. The producers got screwed. Um, farmers and uh, ranchers and people making all sorts of products. If they only had one person to sell to, one company to sell to, and in the Midwest, with ranchers, you have that. You know, the big four have divided up, you know, the Midwest and the West. Um, so functionally, you only have, you know, one company you can sell your cattle to. Um, you're, you're captive. And, and so certainly the chicken farmers, that's true, because they're under contract. 
So you didn't have any competition at that end, but but the the system turned a blind eye to that, and it and it still has that memo. It's just a memo too. This wasn't a change in law. It's just sitting there in the Justice Department, and a um, uh, a Biden appointee serious about antitrust can simply write a new memo, and uh, can hope that they will. Um, and you know it'll be driven as much by the tech industry, I think, if they do, as as from food. But it's clear that the Biden administration has their eye on concentration in food. And the hiring of Lena Khan is a pretty clear signal. Um, and they hired Tim Wu also, who is also someone who really gets it about antitrust and understands how this tool has essentially been eliminated um, uh, from the government's arsenal by this Reagan appointee whose name we don't even know. Mm. Um, so. That's what I'd watch for, if there's a change in the policy around antitrust. And that will um, uh, open up the possibilities of really looking at what seed companies, meat packers, um, and supermarkets are, do are doing to farmers. Um, because that's, uh, you know, that matters as much as what's happening to consumers. Yeah, yeah. And in the end, the consumers lose too because they lose choice. There, there stops being a choice of, do you remember those blueberries from Hugh Kent Did you, you, that we sent you oh, a year and a half ago? Yeah. Really good blueberries. They were fantastic. We had a big box and it's my wife's favorite fruit. Yeah. Yeah. And where were they coming from? Where they came from Florida. So yeah. kind of first ones in, in the US coming in and he's got a beautiful, he, Hugh and Lisa have a beautiful 20-acre, beautiful farm. We've got all this land preserved kind of for wildlife. She's a biologist. And, and then in the middle of that, they've got this 20-acre, totally glistening green blueberry farm. Wow. And they just mow between the beds and blow the cuttings onto the beds, and that's the mulch, and that's the fertility. And, you know, they're really struggling with staying in business. And it's because they can't get their product on the shelf, even though it tastes so good. Yeah, they were really fantastic blueberries. Yeah. The supermarkets, dealing with the supermarkets. Well, indeed. So he used to sell them to Whole Foods. And, and this year he was told he had to go and talk to Global. Whole Foods Global. Whole Foods Global. And that all berries had to go through Global now. For tomatoes, I can sure taste that way now at Whole Foods. I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. I've been like, so when we live in Cambridge, which is only for part of the year, yeah. Whole Foods is the best produce that we can find yeah. once the farmers markets close, and their berries are horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I come from California, so I'm yeah. a little spoiled, but um, yeah, they feel they taste like global berries. Yeah, so for me, that it's it's such a clear example of what we all lose when you have a monopoly that is making a deal and saying we don't want the competition we're going to give you berries every day of the year which yes. is wonderful okay. and we're very good at making sure that we don't run out which is you know a wonderful thing for an eater who really wants to put blueberries on their cereal but they will not be they will be industrial blueberries and if you happen to want the kind of blueberries that you and Lisa grow, and they grow them at scale, and they're very good at it. You can't get them. Well, and Global's going to say, sorry, not enough product yeah. for us to bother with. Right. Because right? they're <laughs> looking for efficiencies. They, they don't want to have 20 contracts with 20 different blueberry growers. They just want a couple. Right. So that, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's so many problems with, with this concentration. And, um, uh, and it does hurt the consumer eventually. The consumer has a stake in it. Um, but... It's not just about the consumer, it's about the citizen. Yeah. And it is a democracy issue. It's just not a price issue. Um, and, you know, as a culture, we're too obsessed with price. I mean, industrial agriculture does an amazing job of giving us cheap meat, you know. Um, meat is something, you know, uh, beef or chicken, take chicken. I mean, this was luxury food, you know, for most of history. And, and in America up until, you know, World War II, or the 50s, um, chicken was the, the expense of meat you had on Sundays. And um, it's astonishing how cheap it is. Um, 
And so that's what a lot of people see, you know, the blessings of industrial food. Now, you have to look behind the curtain to see how you produce a chicken that cheaply. Um, and it's pretty horrible to all concerned. Um, but I think what has sold Americans on industrial food is simply price. Yeah. Pile it high and sell it cheap. Do you think it will be possible to persuade people that price shouldn't be the only thing that they care about or the deciding factor? Well, that's what those of us who tell stories about food, farmers and writers, have been making the case. It's not the same stuff. Um, you can't compare these two chickens, you know, this pasture chicken and this, you know, Purdue chicken. They're fundamentally different products, different experiences. Just taste them. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the argument that's been made. And for a certain part of the population, that works. But a lot of people don't have enough money to make that choice. And um, so, you know, the, the question is not how do you, I mean, you have to give, people need more money so they can afford to spend more money on food. Now, they may decide to spend their more money on something else, but we've essentially, you know, um, incomes have fallen in America since the 70s, like in real dollars, right? All through as the labor movement fell apart, neoliberalism took over. Um, we subsidized that decrease in income with cheaper and cheaper food. So cheap food is kind of locked in. Um, it's, it's keeping people alive as their incomes have fallen. So it's very hard to just turn and say, hey, this isn't the, you're not paying the real price of food. Um, this is what a chicken should cost. Um, that's kind of a non-starter as a conversation for a large slice of the American public. So fixing the food system means fixing everything. It means fixing wages. It means a higher minimum wage. It means, um, uh, you know, until people have, just take them back to the real, you know, I forget, I, I saw some numbers of what the, what, what the minimum wage would be if we corrected for what's happened since the 70s. It's like $24 an hour. Um, people had a lot more money, you know, relative to what, um, to where they are now. And so, Cheap food has just been baked into our economy. And, and, and that's what's made me realize we're not going to get fundamental change until that changes. So, so two very big things have to happen. You know, one is serious antitrust, and the other is putting more money in people's pockets. Um, I think when people taste really well-grown food, they, they appreciate the difference. But they don't get to that point very often. Um, they they have to buy based on price. Yeah. In my experience, it's not even a choice in a store, in a supermarket chain. I, I, I've sold to supermarket chains for a long time. And so we were the, we were the, the organic tomato for stop and shop for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they were too expensive. We hadn't raised the price in like 12 years. And they were too expensive because suddenly there were a bunch of... Being undercut by Mexican... Tomatoes. Mexican hydroponic tomatoes. And um, I'm, not, I'm not complaining for me. We sell all of our crop. We found other markets. But it is pretty significant that Stop and Shop w was the big New England chain. Now Walmart is. So back then, Walmart wasn't wow. selling food. But, um, you know, so people... And we certainly got letters about it. I got angry phone calls. Where are your to tomatoes? I can't get them. And so people lost that choice. Yeah. It wasn't that they weren't willing to pay. They were willing to pay. Yeah. They just lost the choice. You use blueberries, they lost the choice. Yeah. And after a while, they forget there ever was such a thing as food that tasted like that. It's a, it's a strange thing. Well, yeah, except people are going to farmer's markets and joining CSAs, and there is a desire for that taste. Yeah. And... And this is where the chefs come in. I mean, the chefs are, um, the chefs have been the, the best promoters of good farming. Um, you know, when, when Alice Waters starts, you know, telling her story about food, which is great food begins with great farming. Uh, and Dan Barber's telling the same story. And um, 
that makes a difference. I mean, the, 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 the chefs um, took some of the, the, the light of their glamour that they had and they reflected it on farmers in a, in a way that was really profound and, and I think contributed to, the, to the, the rise in the prestige of farming and, and certainly the morale of farmers, and, um, but also to the consumer, you know, a signal that this is, this is different food and it's um, the experience is worth something more um, than the supermarket product. Um, yeah. So, you know, all that, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I find it thrilling to go to farmer's markets, which I do whenever I can, and just see that, you know, long lines. I was at the one right at, uh, um, at the Harvard Science Center, um, and lots of students there, you know, and there was, they were lining up for corn, and um, it was great to see. Yeah. So, I mean, I think people have had, you know, they've, they've had that taste. They've had that, that taste experience, and they know what's, you know, they know what's available. If, but they have to work harder to find it. You're right, because they're not finding it in the supermarket. You know, seven years ago, the supermarkets, all the chains were starting to buy local. It was quite fascinating. Hannaford sent a whole film crew up, I mean, 20 people to film our farm, and they sent a model for me to walk around the farm with. And uh, it, was, it was funny, but they sent very talented photographers and videographers. That seems to all be going away now. Mm. And uh, I think it's, I, th I don't know if it's Walmart setting a new standard of cheap wins. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what that's about. I mean, my guess is it's just inefficiency. You know, it's what I said earlier, too many contracts. Mm -hmm. um, if we can get one distributor to give us everything. And also to have to retool during the season. Oh, all this stuff is seasonal. Oh, that's complicated. Yeah. I've got I've got this distributor who's willing to give me the tomatoes twelve months of the year, um, so I, I just think it's the drive toward efficiency and um, you know which is uh, so central to capitalism. But you know one of the things we've learned, especially during the pandemic, is that efficiency um, is very brittle, and um, you know there's a there's a kind of national security argument for having lots of small farmers, which is that when the big ones go out or, or you know, are hit with weather events because of climate change or whatever, or pandemics or whatever it is, that you have other sources. There was a period when the, the food chain at the beginning of the pandemic collapsed. Um, and we were saved by small agriculture um, in, to a considerable extent. I mean, there were shortages in the supermarkets. Um, there were uh, in, in the, all the supply chains were screwed up, and you had this restaurant food chain, and or, or industrial in, institutional food chain, right? That's selling from big farms to to Cisco and restaurants and and institutions, schools, uh, universities, corporations, and that stopped, and yet you had this incredible demand on the retail food system because people were at home cooking and they weren't eating industrial food, except in prisons. And um, so everything got screwed up. And you saw, uh, you know, um, CSA membership went way up. And those small farms, even the ones selling to restaurants, they could retool and they found new markets. And, you know, I read about even dairy farmers who still had some pasteurization equipment on the farm were able to retool and sell directly. And so there is a resilience in having lots of small farms who have more than one market, you know, that are selling into several different markets. And whereas the industrial system is so efficient and targeted and we do one thing and we, and we sell it all here. And those are the companies that, that had enormous problems. Eventually everybody retooled and, you know, it, it was fixed. Um, but... But we had a, it was a very teachable moment at the beginning of the pandemic where we realized that, oh, putting all your eggs in one basket. The example that everybody remembers is the toilet paper shortage. There was plenty of toilet paper, but a lot of it was going, you know, was, was being sold in giant rolls to corporations. And, and you, you couldn't sell that in a supermarket. And, and you know, and it, there were different companies and different product sizes and different number of plies, all this kind of stuff. 
but we are, you know, and just in time inventory too. I mean, we are just, we have such an efficient system, but efficiency has huge vulnerabilities. And, and those were exposed during the, uh, yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. No, was, uh, yeah, amazing. Can we go for a minute? Uh, you know, you talk about the, the hopes for the Biden administration. I think we had hopes for the Obama administration as well. Um, in fact, you quoted something that he wrote after reading something you wrote. And uh, what he wrote was beautiful. I thought, my God, there's a manifesto. It. Yeah. It, was a, it, it wasn't something he wrote. It was something he said, in, something in, he said. in an interview in Time yeah. magazine. And it just showed he, got, he understood the whole system, the links between how we're growing food and diet and all these kind of things. And he was um, very engaged by the critique of the food system. Um, and uh, not just mine, but he was, you know, he was reading and listening to other people as well. Um, and initially, he sought to do something about it. Um, at the beginning of his administration, there was an antitrust initiative, um, and there was a series of hearings uh, throughout the Midwest, and may not, maybe not only the Midwest, um, where both Eric Holder, the Attorney General, and Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, were building a record, and they were they were getting they were having hearings, and farmers were speaking about their inability to, you know, being black marketed, you know, by a certain uh, packer, and only be, and only having one place to sell, and concentration in the seed industry, and farmers went way out on a limb to testify. These are people who could get cut off by, you know, um, Tyson or whoever they were selling to, just like that, um, and they and they spoke, and there was a, there was a promise that something would happen. And then after the 2010 midterms, uh, where Obama really got shellacked and Republicans ran on the fact he was anti-business, um, he stopped, he dropped it all. Just nothing was heard, pulled back. Uh, his antitrust person in the Justice Department quit because she knew nothing was going to happen. And that was it. Um, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that, you remember Obama won in Iowa it's hard to imagine a Democrat winning in Iowa now. Um, he actually won twice in Iowa. But I think he lost the farmers because of that. And, you know, you talk to farmers in the Midwest, they all remember that, and they feel like they were stabbed in the back. Um, now, because he didn't stand up. Because he didn't stand food. up. For, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, he, and he made a gesture like he would. Um, he basically gave Michelle Obama the portfolio of dealing with food. And she did some valuable things around school lunch and, and certainly elevating the importance of food as a, um, you know, in health. And um, she planted a garden, um, which was organic, although they didn't call it that. Um, I mean, maybe it wasn't certified, but they were using organic methods. Um, but again, to call it organic was too controversial. They didn't want to do that. Yeah. They, they would offend Walmart would be on the phone or whoever. Um, so I think that Obama was a disappointment to people in the food movement and to uh, and certainly to farmers who who look for some relief that had been promised and never arrived. Biden knows that history, um, and it's interesting he seems to be stepping back into that. And you know, is it too late for Democrats to win the farm vote? I don't know. I think if they did something serious about antitrust, it could happen, and that could really scramble the uh, scramble politics in some of the red states. Yeah, I hope they do it. I really do. Um, you know, I'm I mean I'm sufficiently skeptical that they will muster the courage, but the hires suggest that they're serious, and you know that's what you're supposed to look at. It's like who 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 are they hiring? Because the policy you get is usually a result of that. All right, um, let me. Let me throw out a question from Elliot. Um, do we stand a chance? <laughs> <laughs> Who's we, white man? <laughs> exactly. So he was talking about the Real Organic Project. And he was talking about the movement to create a label with integrity that, that supports an agriculture that we all want to see happen. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a serious question, actually, because... So far, in terms of reform, we haven't stood a chance in government reform. I'm, I'm not saying, oh, it was a terrible mistake to let the government get involved. 
I don't think not having the government works either. Regenerative is a good example of that. Yeah. It's the problem is that there's blood in the water and it's our blood and the sharks come in because right. that's what they do. They they, yeah. they, they come. Well, and the and the pioneers of organic and I count Elliot among them. You know, created something incredibly valuable um, that the sharks are interested in. <laughs> Created the blood that, that is drawn the sharks. Um, I don't know what we stand a chance. I, I mean, what would victory look like? I mean, if if victory is uh, a strong label with integrity um, within the federal system or outside of the federal system, I mean, that's a huge question. I mean, I think that you know. We've all learned a lesson of, you know, and people predicted this when, when organic certification came along. I mean, I, it was incredibly useful in some ways and did a lot, and, and, um, uh, but it also created this vulnerability. And the NOSB was supposed to be what would, you know, was going to be the bulwark, and that didn't work. Um, and I think that. You know, so I, I guess the question is, where does it happen? I mean, maybe there's a new label, you know, but do you give up on organic? I mean, that's such a huge step. I mean, you know, so much um, goodwill and, and um, has been built into that term. Um, and maybe that's what real organic is about. I don't know. Um, you know, creating a label outside of that that uses organic. But are you allowed to? Don't they own the word now? Well, they own the word USDA certified organic, those words. But but we actually do require USDA certification. Yeah. So we're an add-on label. Right. So we we are not trying to take that down. We're trying to save it actually. And well, I'm betraying my ignorance about real organic. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what we do. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, then I do think there's a chance for that. I mean, I think you know, again, you get the story out about why you need that add-on and you've damaged organic. But organic has been damaged. <laughs> That's just the truth. Um, so it's politically, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you know, you have to thread this needle very carefully. Um, you have to tell a story that organic has been undermined yet can still be saved. Um, and that's a, that's a, those are always complicated stories to tell. Um, so I, you know, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. It's, it's, it's well worth trying to do though. I mean, we, there are values here you want to protect. Um, and, uh, and in animal agriculture, too, I mean, I think it's really important that you set a higher standard that involves pasture and, and uh, uh, animal welfare, uh, stronger animal welfare than we have in organic. I mean, that was a big fight at the beginning, and there were already big players in organic chicken, right? And they, yeah. they fought to keep uh, welfare standards pretty low. Um, but, you know, and I, I remember this whole, like, I remember for Omnivore's Dilemma visiting a chicken farm that was organic and it consisted of a, a lawn outside a long chicken house with a couple doors that they didn't open until the birds were like five weeks old because they might get sick. And, uh, and they were slaughtered at seven weeks. So it was like a two week vacation rather than any meaningful lifestyle for these chickens. So that was, that was the very beginning of organic. So the worm was in the apple already. Yeah. Um, and that was the negotiations that, you know, attend any kind of political situation. But something needs to be done about it. And, um, uh, and so I think your challenge is telling the truth about organic without, without damaging it. Um, and, uh, and, but people don't know, you know, people don't really know that you don't need soil anymore in organic. Um, People don't know that you can have, that there are organic feedlots. They still have this, you know, I called it organic pastoral. Um, they have this image in their heads. Because um, the big guys are also telling a lot of the story in their marketing. And they, you know, um, so, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that something, you know, can be done to, to arrest this or call people out. Um, but I don't think that story has really gotten out there. 
You know, you, you've talked about uh, we don't have a food movement until we can light up the switchboard. Yeah. And uh, so I agree. And, you know, I was at a, a meeting and Shelley Pingree was there and, and, I, and Jim McGovern and I said, you know, you guys can't do it without us and we're not, we don't have enough support yet. To pull around the to pull on the transformation that we're all seeking, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to build a food movement. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I think one of the problems the organic movement has is that it's something I alluded to earlier, which is the consumer is more concerned about pesticides than anything else. Your consumer is mostly fixed on the fact that this is safer food to give my child because it's not grown with pesticides. And I've heard stories about glyphosate, I've heard stories about all these other pesticides. Um, so when they hear that people are growing blueberries or, or um, lettuce hydroponically and calling it organic, they're like, what's the problem? <laughs> so you have to get pretty deep in the weeds to understand that soil is really important and, and um, for you know, so many reasons. But, you know, that, in a way, that's a short-sighted, that, that's a problem of short-sightedness in organic, because essentially the marketing was, you know, cleaner food, purer food, and organic, uh, hydroponic is just as clean, right? They're not using pesticides. Um, right. And, uh, and those, the feedlots, you know, they're not, they're not putting hormones in the, uh, in the cattle, and, and, and so, the people who would light up the switchboards are not motivated because they don't care about the same things that you do or I do. I think that's part of the problem. I think that's a fundamental problem. If, let's, let's just as a thought experiment, the industry got really um, ambitious and said, you know, glyphosate, it should be an organic. It should be in the organic list. You know, it's really okay. And we really need it for this no-till. I think you could light up the switchboards about that. They, they actually did do that. They did do that? <laughs> Seriously? They, they didn't talk about it. So they, it, was, it was a quiet thing. Yes, they were using glyphosate on hydroponic production when they would level the land. And before they laid down the black plastic, they'd spray it with glyphosate. This was down in Florida because the... The grass will grow right through the black plastic, so they wanted to kill everything. And uh, that was being certified. I mean, two weeks later, certified. And we brought this to the attention of the NOP. And, and uh, actually, they said, well, we don't know if that's happening. I said, but would you allow it if it was happening? And, and the head of the NOP reluctantly said, yes, we would. And <gasps> everybody in the room went, <gasps> And, uh, and then, I don't know, a month or two later, we came up with proof that it was happening. We had a letter from a certifier and then f published that four days later. They reversed the policy. They did reverse the policy. Yes, yeah. although not in greenhouses, only on soil. So we don't, you know, they, you could still spray whatever pesticide you want between crops in a greenhouse drop your certification for two weeks and get recertified. But why don't you have to go through three years? Because it's in a greenhouse. Uh, this has never been explained. It's just, that's nuts. It's just what's allowed right now. Well, they are gonna kill the golden goose. I mean, you know, that kind of, that kind of regulation is sooner or later gonna um, destroy the premium. I mean, you hear stories like this, and I'm someone, I'm pretty cheap. Um, and like I weigh the organic bananas versus the other bananas, and like I and I always go for the organic. But this makes me feel like I'd be a schmuck to do that. Yeah, exactly. So that's a really dangerous road to go down. Yes, I I couldn't agree it's more. Very short sighted. But yeah. but you know, as we know, American capitalism is very short sighted. Well, the best that I've been able to come up with is to create an add-on label that represents organic as we believe it should be. Yeah. And that has integrity and transparency. I don't know what else to do. But if you have a better idea, Michael, yeah, okay. I'd love to hear it. Uh, yeah, I don't offhand, but I mean, I do think we need a better label. 
and uh, a stronger label. But you don't need the government to approve your label, right? No. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, more power to you. And then you have to get out and market the label. Yes, I know. Well, that's hard because we're a little group yeah. of farmers with no money. But, uh, you know, considering that, we've had just amazing impact in three years. Uh, I've been BBC World and, I mean, all things you've been on, but, but I'm just a farmer. And, and you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the media is covering this. So that's encouraging. And there is a growth that is, I would say, considerably faster than the first time that organic grew. I was there and, mm -hmm. you know, it was a very gradual progression. With a couple explosions. With a couple explosions, Al Arb, suddenly, yeah. all of a sudden, the stores were begging for, yeah. for organic. Yeah. Before that, they were absolutely not. Yeah. So we'll see what happens here. I, we're not trying to blow it up. We, we, we just want to say, here, this is what you actually want. We know, that's the beautiful thing. Well, there are already millions of people who want it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, if, if, if it's explained to them, um, I do think the culture is moving to an understanding of the importance of soil and soil health. Coming out of what we're learning about microbiology, what we're learning about the microbiome, um, and, and the importance of, of carbon sequestration as a, as a tool to fight climate change. Um, I think that, so I think telling that story, I mean, I don't think it was ready, I don't think it was ripe when the, the, the um, hydroponic fight came along. Um, but I think that, the, the, that there's just kind of this new aesthetic, emotional appreciation of soil that I feel is like out there. And, um, and I think that'll help you. And I think the soil should be right at the center of your message. Yeah. Um, and we are learning that, you know, food grown in healthy soils is more nutritious and, um, and that farming organically can sequester more carbon, you know, at least in animal production. Um, and uh, so, but I think climate has to be part of the story too. Yeah. And that hasn't been enough part of the story for organic. Yeah. Do you have thoughts for those 89 farms that are going to be put out of business by Horizon when their contracts go down? Because nobody, well, we'll see. We're trying to get somebody to pick them up. But it's a pretty draconian move. It's 20% of the organic dairies in Maine, 10% in Vermont, about 6%, 7% in, in New York. And, you know, at the same time, a huge Texas CAFO, I think, Natural Prairie Dairy is 14,000 cows, and they've just built another 4,000 cow CAFO in Indiana. So you can't say, well, organic is going down, the, the milk production is going up. Do you have any thoughts? I, I think, you know, the community is genuinely reeling and trying to figure out, well, what do we do? When we well, I mean, I, you know, people started to do this a couple of years ago, but really pushing grass, the importance of grass and associating cows with grass. And, um, and I was, I, that was a big part of my writing about even the beef industry. It's like, it's unnatural for cows to eat grain. There's something fundamentally wrong. It makes them sick. Um, and, uh, and there are all these benefits to, to grass fed. So I, I just think emphasizing Soil and grass. I mean, those are those are like powerful terms, um, and you can't do grass at four thousand head. <laughs> I mean, they'd have to go thirty miles in, in a day and back. Um, it's ridiculous. But the public still doesn't know that in the last few years, most cows, organic and um, conventional, have moved indoors. Yeah. They still have images of cows out on grass. Um, that, that's really like deep in our DNA. and What's well, on every milk cart. A, yeah, we're reminded every morning. Nice picture of the cow out in the green field. Yeah, and the fact that it's not happening anymore is like, is a radical change. Yeah. And I'm sure the nutritional value of the milk is not what it was either. And, um, uh, but it's organic. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I don't know what happens. I mean, you know, moving dairy to the desert was insane. Um, but grain allowed you to do it. 
and um, and indoor, you know, milking and you know, I mean, the mechanized milking. Um, but the, when when California became the number one dairy state, beating out Wisconsin, I knew we were in big trouble because California's not not where you want to be growing. Uh, you know, you can't grow enough grass for cattle, and in fact, it's. Whatever efficiency it makes economically to grow, to have cattle in the desert, um, you know, we are using our precious water to grow alfalfa for feedlots in California. I mean, we're running out of water, and that's where a lot of it's going. It's almonds and it's alfalfa. And some of that alfalfa is being exported to Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. Um, so... Anyway, I you know I don't know what happens to California dairy when the water runs out, um, but it should be in Wisconsin, it should be in New England, it should be in, <laughs> in states that grow grass. Yeah, that's great. All right, so Michael Pollan, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you, Dave. It's a pleasure. Um, you know, I'm sorry I'm not better informed, but I have not been reporting on food for quite a few years. Oh, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for anything I got wrong. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 53. Please join us next time when our guest is John Tester, U.S. Senator from Montana, an organic farmer and author of Grounded, a senator's lessons on winning back rural America. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. See you next time.